Greetings. So, we introduced the Rabbi frequency in the previous class. Uh, in this class, we will also introduce what is called as the generalized Rabbi frequency. Uh, Rabbi got a Nobel Prize in 1944 and one of the most important contributions to this general field of light matter interactions. Um, it is a subset of quantum theory, subset of uh, um, atomic physics, uh, but it is so specialized that a lot of people consider it as an independent field, um, you know quantum optics or photonics and so on. So, there are different terms by which this field is recognized. And we worried about the fact in the previous class that the probability of transition from a ground state to an excited state that we got from consideration of the sharp levels E1 and E2 gave us a quadratic dependence on time. Okay? And we need to fix this. And to do that, we have to consider the energy width of the excited state. So, we have to consider this energy distribution, which we, we already have got this spectral energy density. So, when you integrate that, you will get the energy. So, we have to make correction for this term. And let us see what we get when we introduce this correction. So, essentially you will have to replace this term that we got. Here you need to integrate over the spectral density from the lower end of the energy width to the upper end of the energy width. So, if the angular frequency is omega 0 plus or minus delta w by 2, you need to integrate from the lower limit to the upper limit. So, we now have to carry out this integration. And when we carry out this integration, we get a different result. Okay? So, let us now work out this integration. So, you have got the one half square that will give you uh, 1 over 4 and when you bring it properly to the top, right? you have got a factor of 2. So, you have to take care of these factors carefully, but it is no more than high school algebra, all right, high school <coughs> mathematics. And do these terms carefully and you have to carry out this integration. And now, you recognize the fact that in, in this integration, you actually have a Dirac delta integration which is involved. Okay? And I have worked this out in some details in another earlier course of the NPTEL on the select topics in atomic physics in unit 7. So, you can look up that particular lecture for details, but you might have done it in some other context also. So, essentially you have a Dirac delta integration as a result of which you will get a linear dependence because the limit of this function f which is defined as twice sine square omega tilde t over 2 divided by omega tilde square, the limiting value of this is pi t times this Dirac delta. And when you carry out this Dirac delta integration, you get the solution which would survive only for omega equal to omega 0, but now you have a linear dependence on time, which is a happy one because that is one which corresponds to the Fermi's golden rule. All right? So, the problem that we earlier faced is now well resolved and you now have a linear dependence of the probability. So, you now have to do some further corrections because uh, the directions of atomic dipoles would be somewhat random in a gas of atoms. right? So, uh, if you are carrying out this interaction with laser which is um, uh, which always is polarized, then uh, you will have the dipole operator to be represented appropriately by uh, the component of the dipole moment 
along the direction of polarization. So that component will give you a factor of cosine theta, right? And then you must average it out over all the angles because in the square, in the probability you get the square of cosine. So the average value of the square of cosine is one third. So you have to scale down this term by a factor of one third. Okay, that is due to the angular distribution uh, to average it over all the angles. So you have a linear dependence on time. Now you have taken care of the um, uh, averaging over all the angles. This is happily in conformity with the Fermi's golden rule. Uh, this is the general relation that you get from the Fermi's golden rule, which you might remember. Uh, it is the transition matrix element of the coupling operator uh, between the electromagnetic field and the and the atomic uh, Hamiltonian and um, you have a linear dependence on time for the probability uh, the rate of transition will be the time derivative of this okay. Um, so now you have when you take the time derivative of this dt by dt will give you unity and the rest of this factor is what will correspond to the transition rate from transition state 1 to state 2. Okay? So this is the rate that was involved in the Einstein rate equation. Okay? And now you have got um, the rate given by this Einstein equation and the rate that we get from this analysis of the uh, probability uh, coefficient right and if you compare the two then you get this coefficient b which is the Einstein coefficient for transition 1 to 2 to be given by the square of d and then there are other constants okay. This is what you would expect from quantum theory that the, the probability and the rates will depend on the modulus square of the transition matrix element right. So that is exactly what you get. So this has been written with reference to omega which is the angular frequency and uh, omega is twice pi nu. So if you write the same expression uh, on the scale of nu then you have to divide it by 2 pi. So the pi in the numerator will be cancelled and you will get a factor of 6 instead of 3 when you divide by 2 pi. So you can write it either on a scale of omega or on nu. So this is the Einstein B coefficient. So let's now consider the strong field limit. All right, and this is uh, this will be of interest when we are using lasers, um, and we begin with the same differential equations for the two coefficients c1 and c2, which are time dependent probability amplitudes of the occupancy of the two levels. Okay. And again, we make use of the rotating wave um, approximation, right? So, and then uh, we will uh, consider exact resonance, okay? So, tuned relationship. And in this, subsequently, we will also consider the detuned one, which will be of very important, um, uh, which will be of great importance to us. But we begin the discussion when it is exactly tuned so that omega tilde, which is this difference, is 0. And having ignored the omega plus omega 0 term, having considered exact resonance, right, you get couple differential equations which look rather simple. And how do you solve them? These are couple differential equations to solve couple differential equations you go to the higher order differential equation as you always do right. So you consider the initial conditions right and take the second derivative denoted by the two dots okay and now you have decoupled them. But the decoupled equations are very familiar equations. This is something that you do in your first course in mechanics because this is nothing but 
the differential equation to a simple harmonic oscillator. You have got the second derivative which is proportional to the original function with a coefficient, right? So this is nothing but uh, the equation of motion to the simple harmonic oscillator with a spring constant k, right? So similar to that and the solutions are well known. So this is uh, the equation to simple harmonic oscillators and uh, the solution will involve natural frequency. This is the Rebi frequency, right? And uh, you have a corresponding time period which is just the inverse of the frequency. And this is the frequency of what is called as Rebi oscillation or Rebi flopping. This term flopping is somewhat popular in this literature but it is nothing but an oscillation which is the more common term that we are familiar with. So uh, they, these are the simple harmonic motion equations. They have to be solved subject to certain initial conditions and the solution, details of the solution will of course depend on the initial conditions. So you can solve for different initial conditions and uh, let us solve for um, c1 equal to 1 and c2 equal to 0 at time t equal to 0 and uh, for these initial conditions the solutions will be sinusoidal sine and cosine right. Uh, the probabilities uh, will go as the squares right and they will oscillate with time okay. So you have considered sharp levels but you are getting oscillatory uh, probabilities. Earlier when you considered sharp levels you got quadratic time dependence which would just blow up as t square. So now in the strong field limit um, you, you get oscillatory uh, probabilities which are shown by the sine square and cosine square plots. So this is, these are the Rebi oscillations or Rebi flopping as they are popularly called and uh, the occupation probability changes periodically, strictly periodically at this Rebi frequency. And this is um, again a happy change from the quadratic time dependence which would just blow up whereas in this case it um, oscillates between 0 and 1 as it should, okay. So this is the Rebi oscillation uh, as it is called but now we will consider detuning. So you are near resonance but not exactly at resonance. So omega tilde which is the difference between omega and omega 0 the resonant frequency omega 0. This is not exactly equal to 0. I might use the symbol delta for this in the future. So this is omega tilde as I am referring to it over now and we consider the solution to the Schrodinger equation for this detuned case now. So you have as before an unperturbed Hamiltonian and then an interaction V which is a laser atom interaction. The interaction is the dipole interaction okay, which we have used in the previous class also. The solutions can be written in terms of this eigenstates of the unperturbed Hamiltonian which is the uh, uh, which is the basis set of dimension 2 and the general solution you can write in terms of the solutions of the unperturbed Hamiltonian with coefficients which are time dependent b1 and b2 okay. But now we can write this Schrodinger equation in the matrix notation in the two dimensional basis so that you have got the matrix representation of the Hamiltonian in the 2 by 2 basis it will be a 2 by 2 matrix. Uh, the diagonal terms will just be the energies and the off diagonal terms will, the will be the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian in the two states. Okay. So this is the Schrodinger equation which we write in the matrix form for the coefficients b1 and b2 but now we are going to do some manipulation of these terms which is very simple but very interesting. 
So, we introduce two other coefficients c1 and c2 which we will use instead of b1 and b2, nothing wrong, right? Because b1 and b2 are arbitrary anyway. So, what you do is to extract the stationary state time dependence e to the minus i omega 1 t out of b1 t and what is left is what you call is a coefficient c. And now we will write the same Schrodinger equation. So, write b1 and b2 in terms of c1 and c2, okay. It is simple but interesting. So, now you have to take the time dependence of the product c1 which is time dependent and e to the minus i omega 1 t which is time dependent. So, on the left hand side you will get two terms. So, the, these are matrix equations having two rows, okay, the left hand side is two rows and one column, right. So, is the right hand side, okay, after you, after you carry out the matrix operations, right. So, just watch how the manipulation is done of these terms. So, you have got this is a matrix. So, this is E 1 multiplied by C 1 t e to the minus i omega 1 t plus V 1 t V 1 2 times this term, right. When you do this matrix multiplication, you always do this in your mind, right. So, just <laughs> do that and then on the right hand side, you get a sum of this times this plus this times this, which is what you have written here. And the second will be this times this plus E2 times this, which is what you have written over here. And this side is written on the other. I did this only because that way the equation fits better on the slide, all right, but it is the same equation whether you write the two sides of an equation are equal and what is left and what is right does not matter, both are right, okay. So, now you can cancel the common terms, simplify this, all right. So, once you cancel the common terms, you simplify it, that is what you have and now you factor out this e to the minus i omega 1 t. So, pull it out of this matrix, but then you will have to divide this second term by whatever you have factored out and when you divide it, you will have e to the i omega 1 minus omega 2. So, you will have the frequency difference over here, okay. And you do the same on the right hand side. So, you have factored this out and now you have got the frequency difference in this term. And now you can cancel this e to the minus i omega 1 t with this e to the minus i omega 1 t which is on both sides. Okay, so this is just simple manipulation. So, now you have cancelled those terms out and now you have got the frequency difference here and again frequency difference here, okay. So, you have got that frequency difference terms over here and here and now work out so, this omega 2 minus omega 1 is what I write as omega 2 1. So, instead of writing it in terms of omega 2 minus omega 1, I write it in terms of omega 2 1 and notice that this term, the frequency difference it was coming in the second matrix, but I have repositioned it to go here because if you carry out this matrix multiplication, you get exactly the same result because the product of the terms is the same 
whether it the contribution came from the second factor or from the first factor. Okay, so this is the manipulation that I was referring to. By doing this, I have managed to move the frequency dependent term, which was there in the column vector, into the square matrix. Do you recognize this? Okay, so here you you earlier had 0 times C1, which is 0, plus V12 times this C2, and this is where this factor was contributing. But that, you can get the same result if you scale this by e to the minus i omega t to 1 times just C2. You get exactly the same result. Okay. So this is a manipulation which is quite interesting and um, having done this we are going to use this trick again by moving this omega to 1 into the square matrix from here by using the same trick that we have used earlier. right? So now you have got an omega to 1 here and an omega to 1 here. So now we do it one more time, <laughs> okay. So here, because it is 0 times C1 plus V1 times C2 and then the second row is V2 1 times C1 plus a 0. So if you look at the second row, which is V2 times C1, then if you move this to the right, it would go with a plus sign e to the plus i omega 1 t and I managed to move this term also inside the 2 by 2 matrix. So all the frequency terms which were coming in the column vectors, in the column matrices, they were coming from the state uh, time dependence of the state vectors, they were coming from the stationary state representation of the uh, component wave functions. Hmm? They have all been brought together in this 2 by 2 matrix, but the mathematics has, um, uh, has left the physics unchanged. Okay? It is the same Schrodinger equation, but we have written it in a form in which all the frequency terms come inside the representation of the Hamiltonian. So, um, so now the same equation, since, since we know what this interaction term V is, it is in terms of this dipole matrix element and then you have got the cosine dependence of the field, right? So you replace V T with, the, this is coming from the cosine dependence of the field and then the V12 has got this matrix element of the dipole operator which we have introduced earlier, right? So this is the 2 by 2 matrix here. and Again, as before, we make use of the rotating wave approximation because notice that you will have terms, you have got a minus omega here and a minus omega 2, 1 over here. So these two have the same signs. So they, they, when, when you multiply this term with this, you will have the sum of the two frequencies. But when you multiply uh, this term with this, you will have the difference. So now you can make the rotating wave approximation, ignore the omega plus omega 1, 2 and uh, retain the omega minus omega 1, 2 and now in the rotating wave approximation, uh, you can write it in terms of the omega tilde or the delta which is the detuning factor that we have uh, been talking about, all right. So now uh, you put that in you have got the dipole matrix element uh, you can do a few simple tricks so you have got the time derivative of the coefficients so ih cross moves to the right it will come in the denominator so h cross is in the denominator as you can see but 1 over i can be written as uh, minus i in the numerator, right? 
but then there is a minus sign along with the dipole matrix D. So, you can now drop the minus signs, all right, and that is what we have in this relation here. So, you now have the Rebi flopping frequency. Uh, you have written this uh, dipole matrix element which was involved in the definition of the Rebi frequency. So, using you can write this result in terms of the Rebi flopping frequency. And write it for the two coefficients and now we have to solve these differential equations. Again these are coupled differential equations. So, what is the difference between this differential equation and the previous that we considered? We had considered omega tilde to be 0. So, e to the i omega tilde t plus or minus would give a factor of 1. So, that was the difference. Now, it is not. Okay. So, these are they look similar, but they are not because now we are considering the detuned case. So, now we have to obtain solutions to these two differential equations. Uh, previously, we had omega tilde to be 0, now we do not and we have to find solutions to these differential equations. You can write them in matrix form, right? Detuning has been considered explicitly. The dipole matrix element is written in terms of the Rebi frequency. And the solutions for subject to certain initial conditions, they will change from one set of initial conditions to another set of initial conditions. So, uh, for a given situation, we will consider uh, that the initial conditions are given by C1 equal to 1 and C2 equal to 0, the atom initially in the ground state. And then the solutions of these differential equations are given by um, what you see over here, but now you see that there is an omega tilde which is introduced that is because of the detuning. Okay? Because of the detuning, you have a frequency gets met, gets modified. This is what is called as the generalized Rebi frequency. So, the Rebi frequency is different for the resonant condition as opposed to the detuned condition. When you take into consideration the detuning, the Rebi frequency actually goes up. It is a square root of the square of the resonant Rebi frequency plus you have to add the square of the frequency difference, which is delta or omega tilde, right? And this is called as a generalized Rebi frequency, which in, in general is obviously different from uh, the one that we used earlier, which we simply call as the Rebi frequency. So, you have now these two frequencies to keep track of. One is the Rebi frequency, which is d epsilon 0 by h cross, and the second is the generalized Rebi frequency, which is somewhat higher than this. Okay? And if you look at the solutions because of this detuning, then the modulus of C2 square will be given by modulus of i square is only unity, then you have got a modulus square of this ratio and then you have got a sine square of this. So, the frequency goes up of the Rebi oscillations. Okay? But what about the amplitude? This amplitude is omega r upon omega tilde, it is the square of that and omega r is less than omega tilde. Okay, so, the frequency goes up, but the amplitude diminishes because of this detuning effect. Okay? So, I will represent this omega tilde as the generalized Rebi frequency, which uh, 
superscript G and subscript R, R for rabbi and G for generalized, okay. And the detuning effects are twofold. One is that the flopping frequency increases, but the amplitude of oscillation diminishes as you move away from resonance. So this is the effect of detuning. And then on top of it, you may be using pulsed lasers, which means that the electric intensity of the electromagnetic field vector will be time dependent. And that appears explicitly in the Rebai frequency. So the Rebai frequency becomes time dependent. Okay, epsilon zero is the amplitude of the electric field. Okay. It is amplitude of the, it is a time dependent amplitude of the electric field. So that becomes time dependent. So the Rebai frequency becomes time dependent. And you can define what is called as the pulse area. So the, the flopping will take place as long as you apply the field, right? When you stop the field, the interaction will stop, right? And when you stop, if the atom is raised to the higher level, it will stay there. If it is brought back to the lower level, it will stay there. So depending on how long you apply the pulse, you can either move that from the lower state to the upper state or vice versa. In fact, we discussed this when we talked about the um, uh, quantum gates. And we had uh, this states represented at the north pole of the block sphere and at the south pole of the block sphere. And if you want to move it from the south pole to the north pole, you could do it by applying the pulse for an appropriate time interval, right? So it is essentially the same idea. So it depends on the pulse duration and uh, appropriately these pulses are called as a pi pulse or the pi by 4 pulse or the pi by 2 pulse and so on depending on how you transform the qubits over the block sphere. So you have this, this is typically a dimensionless uh, pulse area that uh, is a measure of uh, what type of transition you will effect on the block sphere, okay. And um, if it is, if the atom is uh, originally in the ground state uh, and if it is subjected to a pi pulse, then it will move up to the excited state and then C2 will become 1 and C1 will become 0. So on the other hand, if it is subjected to a 2 pi pulse, then it will go up, but it will come back. So uh, I will stop here for um, this class. Uh, we have time for a few questions. So please feel free to ask. Uh, sir, what is actually this uh, area of the pulse? Is it depending upon the time duration that we are giving? Yes, to? yes. Okay. If it is, an it, it, it is an integral of the time dependent amplitude of the electric field over the time interval. So in case of an attosecond pulse, uh, yeah. its area would be less than a femtosecond pulse. Can we say like that? It depends uh, on the strength of the field also. It's, it's not just a product. It depends on how the field is changing with time. Right? So it, it is just like um, the area under a curve. Okay, if you have just a, a function which you plot a function of one variable, so the area under the curve will depend on the profile. So it will depend on what kind of time dependence the electric amplitude has.
So we have um, essentially considered uh, the electromagnetic field uh, to be described by classical waves, all right? Uh, we will also in subsequent classes take into account the quantum nature of the electromagnetic field, okay? So, so this is some sort of a semi-classical description. It's midway between classical theory and quantum theory. The atom is described completely by quantum theory. The electromagnetic field is described by waves. But at the same time, there is a certain photon corpuscular attribute that we have certainly referred to. So it's somewhere in between classical and quantum. So we will in subsequent classes make formal use of quantum theory. We will quantize the electromagnetic field so that we consider proper photons over there, all right? So photon absorption uh, will involve the destruction of a particle. The photon creation will involve the creation of the particle. So we will use the second quantized creation and destruction operators to describe the photons. Okay, thank you very much.